Hey everybody, we're back for part two of my uh, story, the story of Isaac, um, miracle, sacrifice, and the gospel. And I forgot to plug it in my first video, but um, I've got a blog if you want to check it out. It's www.theflowage.com, and you can check that out um, anytime you want, obviously. You know how to use the internet, I'm not worried about it. But anyways, if you want to check out my blog, that's there. Alright, so we're going to talk about the... Uh, the sacrifice of Isaac in this second video um, and not that I need to recap it because I think I harped on that point in the first video on, enough that uh, I don't need to re re do a full recap but we what we learned in the chapters leading up to uh, the chapters in Genesis leading up to Genesis chapter 22 were the story of Abraham and Isaac and God asking Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice on a mountain um, what we learn is that already God had at least five times, five times in the Bible maybe, God said it more to Abraham. We don't know what his prayer life was or what was going on, but we have five accounts that God promised not only that Abraham would become a great nation, but there's a great nation, um, that nation was going to be so awesome that all the other nations come to it and are blessed by it, is going to come through Abraham and through his seed, through his, uh, his own sperm, um, impregnating um, an egg, um, that this promise is going to take place through his sons, and not only through um, his own seed, but through Isaac specifically, through the, this child Isaac that was uh, uh, going to be miraculously born to these people at this old age. Um, Abraham, according to the Bible, was 100 years old um, uh, when this happened, and, and Abraham had to wait 25 years from the time God first gave this promise all the way until um, he was 100, 25 years later, till this promise actually came forth. So what we learned um, is that um, there's no doubt that Abraham believed. This is where we left off when I wrapped it up. That Abraham knew for a fact, there's no doubt in his mind, that um, this promise that God had given to him, that Abraham was going to be uh, a great nation would be known uh, through Abraham because of Isaac and his kids, that Isaac was going to have to live. Isaac had to be alive unless God lies. Now, I don't think Abraham thought that God lies. So this is where we enter into the story is that God has made this promise to Abraham. Abraham, tried, Abraham and Sarah tried to fulfill God's promise in having an heir through this slave girl, Hagar. Um, and Ishmael was born. Um, and as a side note, uh, Ishmael is uh, what uh, the Islamic faith. There, there, you know, there's there's Jews that believe in Abraham and and, and, and the Israel Israel nation through Abraham, and Christians believe in Abraham, of course, and and the Islamic tradition believes in Abraham. But there's two different sides of the of the family tree. You've got the family tree that has Isaac, and that's where the Christian and Judeo Christian and Jews believe. Um, that's their tradition. But then the is the, the the Islamic tradition is that um, it's the son Ishmael. Um, that um, was kind of the lineage of all the people that came through um, the Islamic tradition. So it's just a little sidebar. But um, we know that uh, you know, Isaac, uh, this promise was made uh, to Abraham that it's going to be through Isaac. Okay, so Isaac had to live. It, there's no question that Abraham, at this point, he had gotten into, into his head. He, as, I, as I was trying to mention that this promise was made to Abraham when he was... Uh, 75 years old, Abraham and Sarah tried to create, you know, tried to make God's promise come to pass in their own strength, in their own doing, um, in the creation of Ishmael through a slave girl um, impregnation. And he was 86, Abraham was 86 when that happened. And then finally, God spoke to him again and said, no, it's not going to be through Ishmael, it's going to be through Isaac, your son, it's going to be through your own, your own issue, your own flesh and blood, it's going to be through you, that this nation is going to be great, and it's going to be Isaac's offspring. God says that finally in that last chapter, chapter 21, I think, that it's going to be through Isaac's offspring. So, so God promised that Isaac is going to have kids, okay? Now, we finally enter into Genesis chapter 22, knowing that that's the promise that God made. Isaac's going to, going to have kids, and his descendants are going to be great, and this great nation is going to be made out of Isaac. So that's, we have to come into that um, understanding before we even get into Genesis chapter 22 and the story. Um, First things first, we have to address this idea of, the, we, of, of this child or human sacrifice thing. 
right? I mean, the first thing in our modern mindset, uh, this is 2020, the year 2020, we think, what the heck kind of a God would ever ask someone to perform a child or human sacrifice? Good God, no pun intended. I mean, what is going on here? I mean, if that doesn't just rip at your heart and make you do a double take and just stop and say, what? What? I mean, this is one of the arguments that, that many uh, atheists or agnostics or people that have been beat up by the church or beat up by Christians, they, they stop and go, hold on a second, you know, I can believe in your Jesus who, you know, said love your neighbor, turn the other cheek, and, and, and even love your enemies. I can believe in, I can believe in that, but who is this God that, that asks people to, to, mur to literally murder their own children? So we've got to just address that elephant in the room. Um, and I've heard this explained a lot of different ways. I grew up in an ultra-conservative home, um, and everything was about, um, if you want to please God, you just need to be obedient. It doesn't matter if you understand what's going on. It doesn't matter if um, you have any heart problems. Uh, not, not, not like a heart attack problem, but if your heart disagrees with what you're doing, um, or if you feel bad about, uh, you know, God's asking you to do something, it doesn't matter. Just be obedient. Be obedient. Be obedient. It doesn't matter if you um, believe it or not, or God just wants obedience. So if he tells you to kill your son, be obedient. And that's what God's looking for. He's looking for blind obedience. Okay? That's why I, I've heard that explained that way as a kid. And, and, and uh, when I became, I guess, a regular evangelical in my teens, I've heard different spins on the story and um, on the story of Abraham and Isaac and how, how Christians have tried to explain of the story, a lot of times um, it's presented as, you know, we don't really understand the nature of God. We don't understand how he works in the world. We don't understand his ways are far above our ways. His ways are wise. And so, you know, all we can do is if, if God said it, then it must be holy and good, right? Um, that's lots of different ways around, but still um, some of the, I guess I haven't talked to anybody personally about the story in a while, but I can imagine some people, it, that's not a satisfactory answer for them. So I'm going to try and provide a little bit of uh, uh, my opinion um, and some of the things I've, I've heard uh, about the child sacrifice and uh, human sacrifice thing before we move on. Okay, so first things first, the cultural background that's going on on human sacrifices. What we don't often know is that in the Near East, in the Middle East, you know, the, the Iraq, Iran, Syria, uh, you know, uh, uh, Palestine, Israel, Egypt, all these different cultures, child and human sacrifices was completely normal. They happened all the time. In fact, you know, uh, they believed perhaps that the deities, that the gods, you know, they, they wanted a child sacrifice, that a child sacrifice would somehow appease them, that would, they would, they would stop their wrath and stop their anger, and, 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 the, the, and somehow the, the gods would be thankful and satisfied that they offered a child. Not, not only a human sacrifice, but child sacrifice was also very common. Um, that's not just a Bible thing that Christians say. I mean, I, I was uh, on, on the web the other day looking at the, uh, I think it was the National Institute of History or something, but it was the England version of their history museum. And this is just an article from last year or 2018 talking about how they had found some fossil evidence up in Syria. You know, Syria, I don't know, I can't imagine how you're looking at this map. You got the Mediterranean, you got Israel over here and uh, Egypt down here and Saudi Arabia, but Syria is up here. And they found evidence of remains of child sacrifice up there. And they thought that all those child sacrifices were more in this Mesopotamia area, you know, between the Tigris, Euphrates, River, which is, you know, Iraq, Kuwait, Iran, that area. But they found that these child sacrifices were even up in here, you know, up, up on this north of Israel, in modern-day Israel. Um, so it was totally normal. Um, and remember, Abraham, Abraham wasn't a Jew. He, he didn't grow up, you know, in, in modern-day Israel, in that land. He was from... Ur of the Chaldeans. He was from Mesopotamia. He was from the exact same area where all these child sacrifices and human sacrifices were being done. Um, and, you know, if we look at um, even a couple thousand years ago, you know, during Jesus' day, I mean, we had gladiators, you know, in the Roman and Greek, you know, uh, culture where they just murder each other, you know, you know, with a thumbs up, thumbs down type of thing um, uh, for, for Caesar. And, uh, for, you know, killing was a sport. There was no value of life. And so that's only a couple thousand years ago. I mean, think about just a couple hundred years ago. <laughs> I mean, what, 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 uh, 
I can't even get into it, but just what we've done with slavery and other different things in this country and, and things around the world, I mean, there, there's been a very low value on life. Um, so for God to propose to Abraham, hey, go offer a child sacrifice, it wouldn't have been a knee-jerk reaction. Abraham would have gone, what? What are you talking about? That's not a loving God. That, you know, Abraham wouldn't have, more than likely, wouldn't have had, at least in my opinion, he wouldn't have had that knee-jerk reaction because this was a common place. He grew up with it. He, when, when God called him, you know, um, to, to leave his land and go to the land of, uh, the promised land, the land of Israel where God was going to give him this land, he was an old man already, probably, you know, older in life. He had grown up, he had saw child sacrifices more than likely. So this wasn't a knee-jerk reaction. This wasn't something that Abraham said. He didn't have the same take where we went, whoa, 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 wait a second, hold on, what are you doing? That's not a loving God. And, you know, and, 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 in my opinion, the reason why we think that way, the reason why we, we read the story and we go, wait a minute, a loving God would never ask someone to kill their own kid. Especially for the purpose of just, well, I just want to test your faith. I just want to, I want to see what's in your heart. I want to see if you're just going to be obedient no matter what. You know, the reason we look at that now and we read the story and it's, it, it gives us a knee jerk is because we're living in a society that has been totally influenced by Jesus. Um, and there's a great book, I think it's Alvin J. Schmidt, I don't remember it, I read it in college, it's called Under the Influence, and it talks, talks about how Christianity, the influence of Christianity, completely changed the modern world, especially, you know, the Western world, where there, there would be, um, you know, just, just a, a reckless regard for life, that life wasn't that important. Um, and we're, we're now we're viewing um, the story as love your enemies as yourself, you know, turn the other cheek, you know, never ever murder, never kill. We, we have these other rules and uh, 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 societal values that we have that they didn't have back then. Abraham didn't have those values back then. Um, uh, child sacrifice, human sacrifice was normal. So, to someone reading this text, when this text was written, you know, maybe during Second Temple period Judaism or whenever you believe this, uh, this old book was written, um, this was a normal thing. Um, and so it wasn't an odd thing. And for us who look at it now through a, uh, a Christian-influenced Western world, um, we, ha we do have the correct response. We're saying, what's going on? So what's going on here, in my opinion, is, you know, this is the mentality that, that Abraham grew up with. Abraham grew up with an idea that the gods, you know, there are these gods up there, and they live on the mountaintops. That's where God lives. They live on mountaintops, and, and, um, and they're angry, and you need to appease them. That's what Abraham grew up with. He grew up with that idea. And so, um, I don't believe that he had this, uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that Abraham was very accustomed to this. And God had not, apparently not fully revealed himself to Abraham and who he was and what his actual nature was and how he differed from the other deities that were being worshipped at that time. And so what we see is God accommodated their belief system. God accommodated Abraham's belief system. So rather than taking Abraham and giving him, giving him a lobotomy, a frontal lobotomy, and totally changing the idea of God that he had in his head, God worked with Abraham and used the, the idea of God that he had and, and, and entered into that, even though it was sinful and, and, and it wasn't, it didn't clearly, it wasn't who God was. That's not you know, God would never ask us to sacrifice our own son um, in that type of a way um, that, would, that would be unwilling. Um, God entered into that mindset, and we see God entering into that mindset, and we see God asking Abraham to offer his son, just as the other religions of that day would. So hopefully that gives a little more background about what's going on, and the, the wonderful nature of God, who he, he, he enters into our own, he doesn't force us, he doesn't coerce us, and, and, and just take out our brain, um, and, and force us to have a different opinion about him, um, he, he actually comes into what we believe in. And that's why we've had so many problems with Christianity, with you know, endorsing slavery and, 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 and the, you know, pushing down the rights of women and you know, the, the countless other things you can go through, uh, justifying wars and murder in the name of Jesus and the name of God. I mean, we could go on and on. Um, but, but we see this accommodation where um, you know, God doesn't coerce us. He doesn't force us. He doesn't, he doesn't turn us into a robot where we just do exactly what he does. We have this thing called free will. We have to contend with that. Um, but um, as we come to know who God was as revealed through Jesus um, and, and know that Jesus was the only manifestation of God, he was the only representation of God that we can look at clearly and not have to sort through any BS, 
um, then we can actually see his true nature. Um, so that's just wonderful. So, okay, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time on that. We gotta move on. Um, thanks for hanging with me here. So, um, so with all this going on, I'm saying what, I'm trying to get this point across. The bottom line is that there's far more going on in this story of Abraham and Isaac than what appears to be just an unjust God asking a man to do a horrible act of violence just for the sake of a test. And, and, and a test for a God who we're taught through Sunday school that God knows everything already. And so, you know, we're, we're taught to believe that God asks Abraham to go offer his son Isaac so that that way God can test him, but yet God doesn't need to test him, right? Because God knows everything. So that, so we're caught with these crazy dilemmas. We're caught with this crazy, you know, dichotomy of like, well, if God knows everything, this is what we're told that God knows everything and knows all of our decisions, and why is God testing me in the first place? And so not or only are we confused by the idea of God uh, asking Abraham to offer a son viciously in a murder, in a sacrifice, the child sacrifice, we're, we're, to, we're question we're, we're we just don't know what to do with this idea. Well, God already knows what's in Abraham's heart, so we're we're doubly screwed <laughs> if we come to it with that mindset. So, um, what I'm saying is there's more going on here. That's the bottom line. There's more going on to this story than what we've been told and what we normally bring in to the story. Okay, Genesis chapter 22. Here's the story. I'll read just a couple of verses, but then I'm going to summarize this for brevity. Um, you can read the story in its entirety. But this is Genesis chapter 2, uh, verses 1 and 2. It says, After these things, God tests Abraham, tested Abraham. And he says, Abraham. Or maybe you think of a woman's voice. Abraham. Here I am, Abraham said. And here's what God says. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I'm going to show you. And again, as I said, that mountains were the place that people worship deities. So God was meeting Abraham and what Abraham thought that, well, that's where God lives, on the mountains. Of course, God's going to bring me up there to offer a sacrifice in God's presence. So I'm going to summarize the story. We usually read this story plainly out from here. So here the story goes. Abraham does what God says. He goes up to the mountain, ties Isaac up. Little kid up is what we usually think of. Pictures in Sunday school, little maybe teen, uh, preteen uh, or maybe younger. Lies him on the wood of this altar, spreads the wood out, puts him on there. He's all bound up. And then Abraham draws his knife far over his head. This is the picture I had when I was in Sunday school. Way up. And he's up there and he's, and, and he's just about ready to throw the knife down. And then um, all of a sudden this voice goes, Abraham! Abraham! And God says, yes, yes, yes. Don't harm him. Don't harm him at all. And, and, and because now you, you, you're, you're going to kill him and, you know, destroy his life forever, um, now I know that you trust me, okay? And then I'll, I'll, I'm going to bless you because of that. Um, and instead of Abraham offering Isaac, all of a sudden a ram, or a lamb, whatever, a ram gets, uh, Abraham notices there's this animal stuck uh, in, the, in the bushes, in the briars. And so um, God uh, lets Abraham offer this ram instead of Isaac. And uh, Abraham calls that place Jehovah Jireh. Um, the Lord will provide on his mountain. The Lord's going to provide a sacrifice. Um, so that's usually how we read this story. And we, we kind of walk away from it going, what the heck was going on? Why would God ever ask us to, to, to tempt us with evil, this evil of, 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 of just murdering our son and him being burnt up on this altar forever, for all time? How this is usually taught then is that... Um, the takeaway, what the Bible teachers and priests and ministers will tell us, is that the moral of the story is that um, God was testing Abraham to see if Abraham would give everything up, even including losing his only son, whom God promised, losing his own son forever, this, um, just to see if Abraham would be obedient to whatever God said. That's what the moral of the story that we're told from the clergy, and then we're told... Um, you know, that's how we should live our lives. We should just be obedient. No matter how it feels, no matter what, uh, what's going on, just be obedient. So it's, it's, it's a lesson in obedience, right? Um, but, in my opinion, there's something in this text that casts an entirely different light on how we should interpret this story. I'll read it to you. This is in the next volume, the following verses. Genesis 22, we're still in the same chapter. Now verse 3 and 5. So Abraham rose early in the morning saddled his donkey 
and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. Abraham cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place far away. Now notice what happens in this verse. Then Abraham said to his young men that came with him, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship. And then we will come back to you. I'm not making it up. That's what the text says. It says, we will worship. And then we will come back to you. What this means is remember that God gave the promise to Abraham that through his own seed, and not only just any kid, through Isaac, five different times we're told that through Isaac's going to have kids and his grandkids and a great nation's going to come. What this means is that Abraham never believed that, Abraham, that he was going to kill Isaac to be dead and burnt up and lost for all time. He told his very servants that came with him that they were going to come back. Both him and Isaac were going to come back. And presumably within a few days, they, just left, they left the two servants with a donkey, right? This is amazing. You might think that I'm just taking this part out of context or too literal, or that I'm trying to change what the story's narrative is and how we've been you know, taught um, based upon this little verse. I'm just you know, pulling this little thing out of this verse, you know, maybe like an afterthought. And this is what's amazing. Is there any other place in the Bible that supports this view? What's crazy is that there is. And what's this view I'm talking about? This view that Abraham never believed that God was asking him to murder Isaac and burn him up so that Isaac would be obliterated and dead forever. Isn't that cool? No, there, this is where the text says, we're going to go to the New Testament. This is Hebrews chapter 11, uh, 8 through 19. Um, and I'm just going to read uh, the last two verses. Uh, well, Hebrews eight, uh, Hebrews 11, that chapter, and then starting in verse 8, it starts talk. It recounts the story of Father Abraham, right? Um, and it goes through this. And, but in verses 17, 18, um, and 19, I think, might be 17, 18, this is where we find uh, another verse supporting this view. Here's what it says. By faith, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises, so Abraham, Abraham who had, he says he embraced, he finally got it. Abraham finally got these promises. That, All right, God's going to make a mighty nation through Isaac. He who embraced the promises, were about to, he was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So even though uh, God said that it's going to be through Isaac, um, God, Abraham still um, had faith and carried this out. Um, he embraced these promises. It was 25 years from when God first gave the promise till Isaac was even born. Right? It took, God said it, and 25 five, five years later, even with the Ishmael mistake in the middle, finally Isaac came. Um, moreover, um, in the Jewish tradition, they don't believe that Isaac was a little tiny kid, or like a you know ten year old or fifteen year old. They don't believe that that Isaac was ten or fifteen years old um, when Abraham went up on the mountain to offer him. They believe that he was thirty seven years old. And if you if you think about that, I mean that adds another you know uh, got thirty seven years of the story. That means Abraham had sixty two years to think about this promise that God had made to him. And meditating on it. And, and Abraham had finally learned. It said he embraced, he embraced the promises, knowing that he was about to sacrifice his own son. Um, Abraham believed God's word to him, and that and his faith, Abraham's faith in, um, in God made him right, made him righteous. Even though God said that it would be through Isaac that the promises would be fulfilled, Abraham in faith continued in God's request to sacrifice him. Why? Okay? Is it, as I just mentioned, is it so Abraham would just lose Isaac forever for some unknown heavenly reason or to appease the gods or maybe just to test Abraham for obedience? No, because here's what the next verse in Hebrews says. Hebrews 19 says, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did even raise Isaac back from the dead. That's what it says. So 
This is amazing. This is, in my opinion, maybe one of the most mind-blowing verses in the in the Bible um, that ties the story of Abraham and Isaac. I'll just read what I. Abraham fully believed that God was going to fulfill his promises through Isaac, through that lineage. Okay? If God wanted Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, then Abraham had faith that God was going to raise Isaac back from the dead so that God's promise would come true. Abraham never thought that he was going to lose Isaac. At least not forever. Abraham never thought that God wanted to wipe Isaac off the face of the earth for some offering to appease God. Instead, Abraham, who may have or may not have known the reason in full why God wanted him to even perform the sacrifice, he believed that God was going to keep his word and fulfill the promises made to Abraham, even if it meant bringing Isaac back from the dead. Isaac was never in any real danger of losing his life for all eternity. Abraham was never in fear of losing his son Isaac. However, Abraham was the one who had to pull the trigger. He had to be the one that had to go through the emotions of doing that. And he had to be strong enough in faith to believe that despite everything that he was going to see in the natural, despite laying his son out on the altar, despite bounding him up, um, and despite taking that knife in his hand, um, he had to believe in faith that no matter what he was seeing, um, that God was going to bring him back from the ashes of the dead and be restored to life. Isn't that just amazing? The story of Abraham and Isaac isn't a story about God testing Abraham to just be obedient and kill the son, a son whom he promised. What was actually going on, Abraham, verse 19 from Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So what Abraham was thinking in his mind, you know, I don't really, maybe, I don't really know why God has asked me to do this, but I do know that Isaac is going to live. Isaac is going to have kids. God told me that Abraham, uh, God told me that Isaac is going to live and have kids, and through him a nation is going to be blessed. God told me that it's going to be through my seed, and specifically through Isaac, that in his descendants are going to come. So I don't have, I have faith that no matter what's going to happen today, Isaac is going to live. Isaac's not going to die. Isaac is going to have to come back from the dead. And if you're telling me it is God, then I'm believing that Isaac's going to come back from the dead. Doesn't that put a whole different twist in the story? It, it completely changes the way we view the story. Because if we believe that God was asking Abraham to kill Isaac that, so that he'd be dead forever, we don't understand the story. But if we understand that the faith that Abraham had wasn't this faith of blind obedience in doing some horrible act. He had faith that God keeps his word. God, Abraham knew that God keeps his word. Abraham was 75 years old when God told him uh, that this is going to happen. At 86, he had Ishmael, and that was a mistake, and God had to tell him it's not through Ishmael, it's through your own seed. At 99 years, finally God told him again it's going to be uh, through your own seed, and you're going to name him Isaac. And at 100 years old, finally Isaac became born. And then, and then if you believe the Jewish tradition, God, Abraham had 37 years to remember, oh my gosh, I doubted God. I tried, I had an Ishmael. I, I yeah, I complained that I was going to have no heir, that my slave person, that one guy, Eleazar, whatever his name was, um, that he was going to be the heir. But you know, but God said, said that a seed was going to come through me, and it happened. And, he had, and Abraham had 37 years to meditate and think on that. And then when God finally, after this time, um, if we believe the Jewish tradition, um, that um, it was 30-some 30 30 years later, um, and Isaac's a grown adult, um, that God asks Abraham to offer Isaac. I, I don't think Abraham. I don't think Abraham said to himself, "Well, it's all over. Abraham's dead. Isaac's dead. It's all over. The hope of me having a the hope of me having a, 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 a descendants and a seed that's going to have a whole nation. It's all over. Um, the promise is over. God, God's an angry God, and if God wants to take my son, he can son. He can take my son. He's going to be dead forever. I don't think that's what was going on." What the scripture tells us, and it's confirmed in, um, in this uh, Romans, uh, sorry, this Hebrews passage, is that Abraham had a different kind of faith. He didn't have this kind of faith of, well, whatever God you want to do, I'm just here and I'm your humble servant. He had a faith that said, I know what the Lord has told me. I know what he's promised me. And come hell or high water, it's going to come to pass. And I, if, even if Abraham didn't understand what was going on, I don't know why God's telling me to do this, but God, I, I know you're a good God and I know you're going to bring Abraham. If you're going to have to bring, if I kill him, then you're going to have to bring him back from the dead, God, because 
You promised me this is what's going to happen. I have faith that you're a good God and that you would never take him away from me. You promised this. That's the faith of Abraham. That's the kind of faith. That's an unwavering faith. It's this faith that doesn't have this wishy-washy, you doubt one minute, and you believe one minute, and then you doubt. It's this faith that, that um, how I just find faith, and, and, and some dictionaries do, is it's you are fully persuaded. It's a faith that, 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 that it doesn't matter. As Jesus said, if you have faith, you can tell that mountain to move and it's going to be moved. It's not a faith that wavers and wonders and, and has doubts. It's a solid faith. And that's the faith that Hebrews chapter 11, verse 18 says that he reckoned in his heart, right? Um, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. That's what Abraham was thinking. He was As he's going out to the mountain, he's not thinking, oh, it's over. I'm going to lose Isaac forever. It's it's. It's it's a done deal, and why God just well God just does what he he does what he pleases he does whatever he wants, and he was you know just whatever. No, he re, he said you know what, I I believe that even God can raise the dead because he told me that this promise is going to happen through Isaac, and I don't need to keep harping on this, but th hopefully you understand what I'm getting at here, folks. This is amazing. It turns the entire idea of what this story is about from what we think is some strange God that de desires human sacrifices into a story about God um, finding out if Abraham has the kind of faith that God's looking for, a kind of faith that eventually is going to be the lineage that, that, that brings about the Messiah, uh, that brings about Jesus, a kind of same faith that Jesus is going to model, that's going to have a complete faith in God that never wavers, never doubts, who's even going to bring even Jesus back from the dead. And that's kind of a... a, a uh, a sneak preview of what we're going to talk about in the next video with uh, uh, about the gospel of Isaac. So here's the wrap up, folks. Even though we found out that Abraham expected God to raise Isaac from the dead, it doesn't sufficiently explain why God used child sacrifice to find out or to know the genuineness uh, or extent of Abraham's faith. It, it still makes us wonder, well, God, if you want to test Abraham, why didn't you just test him with walking on water? Or why not test him by you know, walking walking on bare feet over hot coals. Why did you have to test them by this this child sacrifice? That seems strange. Why would you do that? Okay. Um, or is it that it's not just a random event that God asked Abraham to do this? Is it possibly that God chose this method with the reason in mind? Yes, this is what I believe, that there is a reason. It was to share that the whole reason why God asked Abraham to go through this whole process um, in offering Isaac that God was actually sharing the message and plan of sending Jesus to the world through using the story. And so we'll start with that on video three.